Let's just wait for everyone to come streaming in. Thanks everyone for attending this panel today. This is our first panel of the conference. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone back and welcome those joining for the first time. Uh, with us to moderate today's two-part panel discussion, uh, we have uh, Mojtaba Amadi and Adrian Chan. So I will, uh, I'll give the, uh, the chair over to, uh, to Mojtaba. You're muted. You're still muted. All right, now you can hear me. Uh, so the first part of uh, today's uh, Let's Talk uh, um, tech session is technologies in healthcare and rehabilitation. And uh, just a little uh, brief that computers, smartphones, virtual reality, teleconferencing, smart environments, robotics, just name it. They all have grown dramatically and we're seeing it uh, these days uh, how effective uh, these tools are. And uh, custom um, solutions are being developed by researchers and uh, being researched in the universities and other institutions. Uh, they're used in healthcare and diagnostics, treatment, surgery, rehabilitation, assistive devices, and so many different uh, applications where it uh, can affect people's uh, lives. And uh, we know that uh, we have an increasing number of Canadians with various types of uh, disabilities, uh, permanent or um, um, uh, temporary uh, disabilities that needs to be, uh, to be addressed. So um, the uh, technology experts uh, today are working hard to enable uh, individuals either, they're working either by in, um, enabling the inv individuals like uh, rehabilitation, um, improving their, uh, their um, uh, abilities, developing assistive devices to help them uh, you know, uh, cope with some of those, uh, or we're changing the environment. So we are either doing uh, one of these three things and uh, almost every talk that we have today it's kind of related to that uh, overall realm. But either we're helping people regain a uh, function, we're developing assistive devices, or we're changing the environment to make it more accessible uh, for, uh, for everybody. So uh, every speaker here is a leader in their area. They're uh, good with technology. They've been using technology for so many years, and uh, that's why they're here. And we hope that we have uh, you know, an excellent uh, set of uh, talks that would uh, suit our audience. So with that, um, I'm gonna start with the uh, first talk. I would like to invite um, uh, Drs. Uh, Anna McCormick and Dr. Uh, Hannah Alazam. Uh, they're both uh, pediatric rehabilitation experts working at CHEO with a great history in using robotics and other technologies in rehabilitation, including one of the robots that was initially developed in our lab. So uh, uh, here are Dr. McCormick and Dr. Alazam. Um, to start, thank you so much for uh, the invitation to speak. If you could enable my, sh my screen sharing, then uh, I'd love to get started. It, um, it, it I, says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. I think that would be uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, could you assist us, please? Sorry, just give me one moment, please. Uh, so um, Dr. Alazam and myself have worked at CHEO. I've worked there for about 20 years now, and Dr. Alazam has recently joined me, and uh, we certainly have a passion of uh, assessing technology and how it can enable children and facilitate rehabilitation. And we really want to uh, share some of our work with you today. You should be able to share your screen now. Thank you. Is that working for everyone? Okay, thank you. Now let's see if I can. For some reason, oh, there we go. I won't spend time on the objectives because they've been pre-circulated. We are gonna talk about a number of robotic walkers. The first two have been studied uh, at CHEO. And um, then we're going to move into our future hopes uh, with respect to development of technology and uh, further devices. So over to you, Dr. Alazam. 
Thank you, Dr. McCormick. So as, as Dr. Uh, Amadi alluded to, uh, the first robot that we studied at CHEO um, for youth uh, was the SolarWalk, and this was designed at Carleton University's Advanced Biomechanotronics and Locomotion Lab. So what's really unique about this walker is it really provides um, an opportunity for those especially um, that may use a power chair or um, even a manual chair as their main mode of visibility. Because what it has that's unique is a mechanical lift. So um, as you can see here, this is a youth with cerebral palsy, so childhood onset um, stroke, and he is a main uh, power chair user as his main mode of mobility. So the device can lift them out of their chair and allow them to explore their environment with great omnidirectional wheels, has a body weight harness support system, as well as the ability to um, customize and control the speed that they'd like to use the device and the amount of support given. So we um, actually studied this device in four stages. And the first stage was actually a case study with a 17-year-old young man with cerebral palsy, GMFCS4, which means he uses a power chair as his main mode of mobility. What was wonderful about uh, this case study is he was unable to use a manual walker as he did when he was a bit smaller and it was easy to get transferred into the device. But he, he was unable to get into it once he got large and became a, a, a larger youth in size. So what was great is using the mechanical lift, he was able to stand up and, and explore his environment for the first time in two years. We went on to phase two of the study, which was a qualitative pilot study. We studied it in five um, individuals and some of the feedback they gave us was that they were quite excited that this had the potential to improve their physical fitness, their independence, like getting to use it, uh, walking around the halls at school. But they did find the device quite large, bulky, and they wanted to see it uh, being able to use on different terrains, like a baseball diamond or a hockey rink. Uh, so this is the generation 2.0 of the solo walk. They took some of our advice, made it a bit more slender and versatile. And we studied this in a mixed methods model uh, at abilities um, gym, so a gym for all abilities, as well as in the school. Uh, what we did is we did take some qualitative data, but also quantitative data. And the overarching theme is we were able to get their heart rate into moderate to intense ranges of exercise when using the device. You're muted, Anna. There we go. Um, so we moved on from that walker and we have, um, we have continued um, study with the larger walker, but we also are studying a smaller walker that's more available for the young children as young as two years of age. This device has interesting features. It is uh, a Ripton walker, but also has um, an exoskeleton-like component where there are motors at the hips and knees. The motion is controlled by a tablet and it provides some nice, precise, repetitive movement that's often looked for in uh, therapy. It's adjust, they can have adjustable amount of support. The patients can push off a little and again, it allows that environmental discovery. Here's just some quick shots of the um, iPad and you can control speed. You can also see how hard the children are working, the number of steps, control the range of motion at the hips and knees, etc. Um, we've tried it on a number of, of children, again, from two to four years of age, and we, there's a larger size, so you can move on up to about 12 years of age. Our experience has been positive, uh, and the therapists have talked about it being very smooth, the children being very relaxed, big smiles, and the larger, more stationary exoskeletons used in the past, it's easier and quicker to use. Um, really, they like the fact you can put your outcomes into the iPad and that you can measure change. I'm going to share a couple of videos uh, with you very quickly because we don't have a lot of time. But this is one of our patients. I think mom may be listening in and watching. Um, uh, this young boy is just working on some stepping. And you can see that he's doing a really good job in his posture, but those steps are are a challenge. And here we've incorporated um, user voice and family voice, which is important to us. Just need you take your earphones out, Anna. For that. Oh, yes. There you go. What do you think of 
with the robot. Nice. <laughs> able to you know, come up with pain and sort of fast the therapy um, where trucks go and do you know, a dump truck and we're going to go dump a load in the, uh, the other side of the basement. So we kind of go back and forth. So it becomes a, you know, a game versus you know, we're just going to practice walking. Um, so I'm sure there's, you know, there's other. So um, again, you can appreciate how the uh, gate pattern was was being developed and here i just got this a couple of days ago him working in um in uh, the basement and now using a um a manual walker so the carryover is there so we were thrilled to see that we are moving into a more formal um study phase with this device and we're looking forward and co-presenting with some very international partners from Spain that are really developing quite a walker that gives you feedback of your uh, position in space. It has the exoskeleton. It even has some virtual reality components. So we're excited about the future. Just to touch on a few other things that we're going to study at CHEO, we're going to study this virtual reality um, gaming device, uh, Boodle's uh, Botley's Boodle Blast, which is a VR game for um, upper extremity, um, facilitating upper extremity movements. This is a social robot that encourages physical activity, makes it exciting for kids, and does the exercises with them. It also helps with children with autism um, in, in social communication. So it's another exciting device. It comes from Australia. And the last one is called Babli. We're partnering with a group in Toronto. This is an app that's going to help identify as well as provide intervention for young children with speech delay. And we'll move on to our next speaker because I understand we're um, potentially doing questions later. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, we have uh, Ed, Ed, Ed Lemaire uh, up next. Oh, so I can't share the screen while the other participant is sharing. So I'm just going to wait a second. Yeah, we'll just have to wait. I can connect in. I've stopped my share. Perfect. Uh, are we okay for my PowerPoint? Yeah, it looks good. Thanks. Okay, good. So, uh, thanks a lot. It's always great to see what's going on at CHEO. Um, now we're going to go to adults, as well as some things that could work with children as well, when we're looking at adding intelligence to various smartphone apps and assistive devices. So, over the last few years, we continue to evolve developing software using the smartphone as the main um, the main element in our research, mainly because we have everything from microprocessors and sensors, multimedia, screen, um, pretty much everything we need to be able to do various things such as augment different uh, tasks and adding new capabilities to be able to look at how people move and looking at posture. So part of this is with the idea of if we can augment certain clinical tests that are done anyways to get real-time information, instant reporting, and start to add some additional things that you can't really do with the regular uh, methods where we're measuring a distance or measuring a time, which will be happening with timed up and go, six minute walk test, 10 meter walk test, a lot of the uh, simple clinical tests that are being able to be done. So an example here, as we can see, just for example, can you see my mouse, by the way, on the screen? Okay, good. Um, in a lot of the cases we found posterior pelvis is really a great location when we're looking at how people move. It really gives you an idea of the core. We can look at angles, we can look at distance, uh, we can look at accelerations. And in this case, we have an app where we take the six minute walk test, we walk back and forth along a um, walkway for six minutes, and the total distance walked is the main outcome measure. But on top of that, we can start to add knowledge. We can look if we put in information on the user, we can now have a reference, you know, based on reference data. And as well, we can have um, the audio 
give a very controlled way, repeatable way of running the test. The other concept is instant reporting. So when we're done, you aren't waiting for reports. You automatically have information from every walkway, average, max, minimum, uh, the speed, step length, cadence, medial lateral sway, uh, anterior, posterior acceleration. A lot of different, in this case, a graph of uh, cadence versus uh, time. So now we have a way where before all you would have is a distance, but just by putting the smartphone on the person, you now are able to augment the test with a lot more information to help understand how to move. Following this, we said, well, what if we go a next step and try and link this to fall risk and other measurements that aren't even the intention of the test? So in these cases, we start to use AI and machine learning. Uh, we have one database we collected of 100 elderly people, 76. Interestingly, we had a, um, a not fallen, but we have a, actually 28 of this one that were prospective data. So they hadn't fallen before, and then they fell following the testing. We have another data set we collected with our uh, collaborators in Slovenia. So we have 125 amputee. And for example, looking at just 10 meter walk tests by applying different machine learning algorithms and extracting up to 146, 150 different features from the data, we were able to get 65% accuracy, sensitivity, specificity to be reasonably good. But even better is when we did six minute walk test and only looked at the turns, you're able to get much better results with like 66% sensitivity and 84% specificity. So it means that if someone just did the six minute walk test and you had the smartphone app, you would 66% of the time, if someone was at fall risk, you would correctly identify them. And we got 84% of the time, you wouldn't have a problem of falsely uh, identifying somebody who was not at risk. So it becomes a reasonable model to be able to apply in practice. Amputee, a little bit different. When we started to look through this group, um, because the gait is actually much more variable, especially people still in the hospital, uh, we had to do some additional step detection research with the group, but we found we're still able to get with one location at the pelvis, again, around 60% sensitivity and almost 95% like specificity. So very rarely would we have a false positive. And you would be able to get with a test that you might do for another purpose, you can start to recognize fall risk. And a pilot test, we also found that we're pretty good at being able to detect uh, balance confidence just from the output uh, and some machine learning. We did another pilot looking at smart watches and aggressive movements with the idea if you had somebody in a nursing home say with dementia or another issue where aggressive things happen, could we recognize the event? And as you notice, we had quite high results with um, almost 100% in many cases ability to do aggressive versus non-aggressive detection. And we chose a bunch of activities that were similar, like clapping or slapping or pushing open a door and shoving. And it's fairly good at doing this. More research is needed, but some pilot test work was finished on this. We're using multimedia. You know, in the past, we developed this app where we would augment the reality view where live real time, you can take your phone, put it in front of the person, uh, move the phone angle, and you can initially look at angles. And that, we've done that research in the past. But most recently, we have ad actually been able to do live marker tracking now on the smartphone. So this is almost, it should be up on the app store soon, almost done. But what you have here is a fiducial marker. So we're able to identify these markers live real time. So the idea is all the person would have to do with their patient, for example, if you wanted to do a, a hip a height measurement, all you would do is take your two markers, hold them in position, look on the screen, automatically. If you want to put a one marker on the arm, lift your arm up, you would have the angle of the arm to gravity or to another reference frame. Very accurate. We compared to Vicon and the difference was less, almost less than 0.1 degrees uh, error. So very little error between. So I think this is quite promising with a lot of possibilities to move live marker tracking to be able to do quick measurements in real time. Like with everything augmented reality on the screen. So you can 
work with the patient and get your results right away. Uh, we made some progress in our idea of a smart hallway where we can instrument a hallway where as the person walks through, we get live markerless tracking uh, outcome measures that we can then use to be able to, might with AI, look at quality of movement, fall risk, other measures. Here's an example up the wall. So if halfway up the wall in the hallway, we put these very inexpensive depth cameras, we're able to now look at how fast the person moves, how wide the step length, and with step detection, as you can see here on the left. Uh, two other examples we'll just get, we do some ways looking at movement, but we also create some assistive devices. Here is an example of our microprocessor controlled knee joint for somebody with knee extension weakness. So what we're able to do Uh, I'm not sure if we've lost Ed. Um, I'm actually going to mute him and pause him because we're actually running over his uh, piece and I don't want to miss out hearing from Jennifer and Lisa. So I'm going to let them uh, unmute themselves and move on to the next part of the presentation, please. Okay, I'll need uh, Ed to, yeah. Okay, um, so thank you Mojtaba for inviting Jennifer and I. Um, we are going to talk about iPads and video games rehab in 2020. And Jennifer is a PhD candidate at University of Ottawa in Rehabilitation Sciences. Um, and she's my colleague at the Bria Research Institute where I'm a research associate. So Jen, we'll start with what is tele-rehabilitation? Thanks, Lisa. We've talked to, we've had a lot of good talks about a different technology and, and here we're just going to kind of set um, the tone with remote delivery of rehab care. So telerehab is a sub um, group of telemedicine and within telerehab, as you can see in the middle, there's different ways to use uh, telerehabilitation. So if we're, for example, if we take teleconsultation, we um, can use um, a consultation from a specialist if a patient wouldn't have access to that specialist in a uh, remote delivery. And then teletherapy would be using um, a form of telerehabilitation to provide uh, therapy, which is OT, uh, physiotherapy, or speech language pathology. Um, telemonitoring would tie in a little bit more with what Ed was saying uh, with, um, with Dr. Lemaire with the smart hallway. So this is looking at using live data uh, that would be set into someone's home to monitor movement and evaluate uh, movement. And then telehome care would be looking more at um, assessing the, someone's environment in the home setting and as well as looking at um, how we can train someone or the family members in the home setting. So those are the four ways um, to use telerehabilitation. Back to you, Lisa. So the question is why use telerehabilitation? Um, there are many advantages. There are also a few disadvantages, but some of the many advantages are things like there's no concern about transportation. So people don't have to worry about driving into the city if they're not, not comfortable doing that. They don't have to worry about uh, going on transit or getting people to drive them. Uh, in the winter, we deal with a lot of elderly people and people with disability who find it difficult to travel in the winter when there's uh, snow and ice and cold weather. We also, some other advantages are things like you can do your exercise or your rehab on your own schedule. You don't have to um, come in at a, a particular time and you can do some rehab every day rather than just one or two hours a week. You can also have your family members helping you and you can work in a familiar environment in your own home. Um, there's a, a good advantage of tele-rehab to prolong rehab and to prevent uh, breaks within the rehab and, and ensure continuity of care. So as soon as somebody is discharged from hospital, they can continue then and they can 
they don't have to wait for maybe a, a class that's provided in the community for only eight weeks and then there's a break over the Christmas holidays for four weeks and then you start again. You can be continuous. Um, it's also good in this time of COVID-19 where you can do things in your own home and don't have to travel or be exposed to others. So quickly, we'll just introduce the two types of tele rehab. One is synchronous, so using live real-time communication. So as you can see here, we can use video conferencing where the patient sees the therapist and the therapist sees the patient moving and providing care in a real-time fashion. And then on the other side, we can see um, that synchronous rehab can also be done by telephone. So not necessarily using the video component, but um, audio for feedback and providing instructions. And tele-rehab can also be done asynchronously, which means not in real time. So in the picture on the left, this is a gentleman who's doing a virtual reality or exergaming game in his living room. Um, he does the games or the exercises, and then the therapist can provide these for him and then check up uh, the next hour or the next day and see what his success rate was and how much time he spent and if he, uh, if he was doing it correctly. You can also do this sort of platform with an iPad if you want to work on cognitive rehabilitation or um, fine motor control for the hand perhaps, and you can have the app on the iPad uh, remember or record the, the outcomes and the success rate. You can also use asynchronous tele-rehab by using smartwatches or activity trackers, which will track your different types of activity or perhaps sleep or other things that you're wishing. And then you can track them um, in real time or later on on an iPad app or a phone app or a computer. And all of these technologies that Jen and I have mentioned have been used or we're actually using right now either in research or in Jen's case in clinical practice. And so they're all available and they're, and they're all being used. So we'd just like to thank some of the sponsors of our research program. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks, uh, yeah, thanks very thank much. Uh, thanks very much to everyone. Sorry, we're running super late on this session. The next session starts in three minutes. Uh, so we're going to end this uh, promptly and, uh, and hope to see uh, Jennifer, Lisa, Hannah, et al. Uh, in the third session where we have a Q&A for all of the sessions. Thanks again to um, all the panelists. Just, just yeah, before ahead, the, so, yeah. so the questions uh, I keep for the, for the panel, if any of the attendees uh, uh, ask a question, it's not answered here, they can just join the, uh, the third session to get uh, some of the answers. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Okay, thanks guys. Everyone.